Just a few weeks ago during lunch on a senior staff retreat, I overheard my colleagues talking about how they intended to spend a few free hours that afternoon. Some planned to nap, a few mentioned taking a walk next to the river nearby. Fairly soon, inevitably, the conversation turned to sports, basketball in particular. Folks started mentioning their various sports pedigrees, tales of conquest and bravado, in some cases, ancient history. <laughs> Got louder and louder as they began to choose sides and throw down challenges. Immediately upon that turn in the conversation, I began plotting my escape. And as the conversation grew more heated, I slunk out the side door determined not to get sucked into challenges of greatness and all the while managing my post-traumatic stress-filled memories of junior high gym class. Now, I may be the only one among us here who has terrible memories of junior high gym class, but probably not. Well, some of us still bask in the glory days of sports greatness. <laughs> the rest of us, I'm thinking, remember awkward locker room races to change into gym uniforms before the bell rang, thick polyester blend gym shorts that for some baffling reason never seemed especially flattering on me sitting in the bleachers in the stifling heat of the gym, smells of floor wax and old egg salad sandwiches left over from lunchtime, and the gym teacher, standing at the bottom of the bleachers, whistle around her neck, poised to utter the most terrifying words in the life of any seventh grader. Okay, kids, it's time to choose teams. Chosen, or not chosen, as the case may be, it's a circumstance of life that starts even before junior high gym class, and it follows us through life experience after life experience, so much so that we have come to understand the word chosen, the experience of being chosen, as a direct commentary on our worth. When we're chosen, we're better. We're faster and smarter and cooler and more worthy, right? You can perhaps begin to appreciate why I could not wait to get away from that staff conversation about basketball. Today, our passage from 1 Peter that Christian just read talks about being chosen. And it's a passage like others in this letter that has been grossly misinterpreted and used to terrible ends. You are a chosen race, the text reads. And you can see how this could, with our modern understanding of the word, contribute to a corporate identity that could get dangerous when applied or misapplied in community. In fact, it has been used and is used to this day to exclude people from the church, to declare our superiority to the outside world, to hurt groups that are different than we are, but it also has been used to tragic ends within the church, a license to behave badly among ourselves. And all of these misuses of the concept of being chosen have damaged the transformational work of the gospel in the world. Today we're in the second of a three-part sermon series on the little epistle of 1 Peter found toward the end of our New Testaments in which an early Christian leader wrote a letter to several growing communities of Christ in Asia Minor with instructions about how to order their lives in relationship to the world around them, with instructions about how to order their lives within the community of believers, and with instructions about how to order their lives in the intimate circle of relationships 
that made up their individual families. And while we know that the lives and circumstances of the early Christians were very different from our own, this letter, we presume, is included in our canon because there must be something for us, modern Christians, to learn, practical reminders of the universal experience of being a Christian. Last week, we focused on what First Peter might have to say for the church in the world. Today, we turn inward and try to understand the writer's message for the work of ordering our lives together within the community of Christ, the church in these walls and the church outside these walls. You recall, if you were here last week, that as far as we know, the letter that makes up the book of First Peter was written to a group of Gentile Christians who were beginning to experience persecution for this new faith that they had taken on. The culture around them didn't quite know what to make of this little sect that had been birthed with the message of a radical Jewish rabbi, but now seemed to be attracting all kinds of people, even Gentiles. And the teachings of these first Christians were strange. Ideas about love and justice and peace. And their little groups were growing so much that they were beginning to rankle authorities of every expression, religious authorities and civil authorities alike. And early Christian leaders must have known that there would soon be a crisis in these churches if they didn't help these first Christians establish a shared identity. For sure, facing the risk of persecution without a clear understanding of what held them together would certainly result in church members abandoning ship. And so, the writer of 1 Peter writes to remind them of who they are in the words of the text. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Wow. Talk about special. Hearing a description like that, it's easy to see how we would sit up a little straighter fix our collars, adopt expressions of superiority. And unfortunately, I think it's probably not accurate to say that the writer of 1 Peter wrote these words to puff up the early Christians or us with self-important arrogance. Instead, I think the writer chose these words for two reasons. First, Remember that most of the Christians who were in receipt of this letter were Gentile Christians. If you were a Jewish convert to Christianity, it was easy to reach back into the history and tradition of your Jewish roots and understand this concept of being chosen as a mandate for your work in the world. You were part of God's people through the lineage of Abram, a corporate identity that reflected generations and generations of shared understanding about who we are. But if you were a Gentile, you didn't have that reference point. In fact, there was some conflict in the early church, if you can even imagine that. Conflict was about these identities. Do you have to become a Jew first before you can become a Christian? And if you're a Christian who is also a Jew, are you something extra special because Jesus was Jewish? The writer of 1 Peter was directly addressing these tensions when he wrote what he did. And you can imagine how the Gentile Christians needed so much to hear those words. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You are God's own people, meaning you belong here. Don't let anybody tell you you're not good enough to be part of this revolution of love. In using this chosen language to describe the first communities of Christians, in effect, the writer of 1 Peter was flinging wide the doors to say, everyone is welcome. And all of us who are gathered here make up the community for which we are responsible to tend and to nurture. 
He wasn't then stroking their egos. He was critiquing the early church for its infighting and divisions. And the second re reason that the writer of 1 Peter used those words is because he was trying to narrate a shared community identity, to remind the Christians that they had before them a holy mandate to walk in the way of Jesus. That is, the task that they had taken on was the same task that Jesus had, not a life of ease or popularity, a perch from which to declare one's superiority. Jesus was chosen too, but he was chosen to suffer, to preach a message that made people in power stumble and fall, that challenged the status quo that was very deeply unpopular. You are all part of this revolution of love. First Peter was reminding the early church, you are chosen people tasked with the risky challenge of living the gospel message so that the whole world can look at your community and see it. I really hate to admit it in public, but after studying this passage very deeply this week, I came right back around to the metaphor I had wanted to escape, junior high gym class. Return with me one more time to the memory I described. Right after the gym teacher blows her whistle and says that it's time to pick teams, then the dreaded choosing begins. At my school, all the best athletes got chosen first, one by one. Does this happen in South Africa too? Yes? Okay. All of them were chosen, and then who's next? The popular kids. They get picked one by one, and then the funny ones, and so on and so forth, down the totem pole of seventh grade society until eventually all the rest of us get chosen too. That whole process is a gut-wrenching blow to fragile egos like mine. But once the choosing is over, it's time for the game to begin. And no matter who you are or what team you were chosen for, whether you were chosen first or you were the very last one sitting on the bench, the attention then shifted to the task of working together so that we could beat the other team. The point of that exercise led by the gym teacher was not to see who got chosen first. In other words, everybody got chosen eventually. The point was to work together with your team so that the whole team could accomplish its mission. If the people on the team sat around on the bleachers bragging about who was chosen first and why that made them better, there would never be anybody actually on the court playing the game. The writer of 1 Peter wanted the first Christians to remember that they were all on the same team. They were all chosen for a task. And now that they were there together, it was time to remember the gravity of their work. The gospel is so important, he wrote. It's critical that you, the community of Christ, set aside all malice, guile, insincerity, envy, slander, for goodness sake. Do not let the evil that characterizes communities of this world come anywhere near this beloved community. You are chosen, and it, because you are chosen, you have a job to do, to be a corporate witness to the world. David Brooks wrote a column this week in the New York Times advocating for what he called a new culture war. He made the case that we don't spend enough time cultivating communities in which true character can be formed in each of us and in our children. Our society, he argues, requires individuals who can navigate their own freedom to contribute to a shared culture of formation, a common moral ecosystem, he calls it. Using recent legislation regarding transgender bathroom laws, as an example, Brooks writes, those laws are about legislating a group, not about what constitutes good behavior. 
They're an attempt to erect crude barriers when a little local consideration and accommodation could easily get the job done. It struck me as I read his words, this is so often the church. We erect our own crude barriers that render us also addicted to sideshows that end with a whiff of intolerance. Instead of remembering to live as if we all belong and the task to which we have been called is more important than the petty divisions we constantly create. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. And listen to what the text says next. In order that you might proclaim the mighty acts of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are here together for a reason. All of us chosen to be in this place at this time. Why? Well, it surely isn't because we're more special than everybody else. It's because we have a job to do. The culture in which our community exists desperately needs us to live fully into who we can be as the community of Christ, a witness that informs the larger culture. Why? Because love is the elemental desire of the spirit, Brooks writes. People are desperately motivated to love something well and to be loved. A core task of communities is to arouse and to educate the loves, to widen and deepen opportunities for love, and to appraise people by how well and by what they love. What would happen if our community modeled for the world the kind of love and hope and promise that Jesus came to teach us? Do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil, the writer of 1 Peter reminds us. You are a chosen race, a, whole, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people chosen to live in gospel community for the world to see how love can change us. I'm not exactly sure how each one of us got to be on this team. Surely we were chosen to be here somehow. And now that we're here, the mandate of that choosing is set before us with a challenge. Behave then with care, church. Every interaction we have with each other either advances the gospel in the world or puts up roadblocks to its transformational work. We decide. We decide. You don't need me to tell you that the world around us so desperately needs us to build and model gospel community. You need only turn on your televisions. All of us awoke this morning to news of yet another mass shooting, this time in Miami. The number of people dead now up to 50. Our mandate as the community of Christ is pressing and clear to spend our time jockeying among ourselves per, for position or engaging in behavior that tears each other down to use any little bit of this community's energy on behavior tinged with malice, guile, and sincerity, envy, slander. That is more than a distraction, friends. That is a sin. Bill Coffin famously said, the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. And he was, quite literally, talking to us. Church, you are indeed a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. Now you and I must choose to act like it. Amen.